welcome to the Eat for Endurance podcast. My name is Claire Shorenstein, and I am a board-certified sports dietitian and endurance athlete. I provide virtual nutrition services through my private practice, Eat for Endurance, and I host this podcast because I love to share the nutrition stories of both professional and recreational athletes, and I also enjoy teaming up with my sports dietitian colleagues and other experts to discuss a variety of important topics. Today's episode is an interview with sports psychologist Riley Nichols. Riley is the founder of Mind Body Endurance, a virtual practice that includes a team of sports psychologists, therapists, and dietitians, including Rebecca McConville, who recently came on the show to talk about REDS. Riley is a certified eating disorder specialist and works with athletes to address a wide range of mental health and sports performance concerns. He regularly speaks to athletes, coaches, and sports medicine personnel about disordered eating and unbalanced exercise and sport. Riley also is an endurance athlete himself, as well as a running and USA triathlon coach. I wanted to have him on the show to address the mental health side of so much of what we talk about on this show the psychological resistance to fueling, for instance, struggles with body image, how lifestyle stress contributes to underfueling, overtraining, and reds, how to maximize performance, not just with nutrition, but with mental strategies, and of course, so many other things. This really is a bit of a grab bag episode of different topics, um, but I really think you're going to get a lot out of it. And of course, we discuss practical steps that you can take to combat some of these common issues and to better support your mental health. So this episode is a little different from my usual, but again, I hope you enjoy it. I hope you find it helpful. And without further ado, please enjoy my chat with psychologist Riley Nichols. Riley, it's so great to have you on. How's everything going today? Um, it's going wonderfully. Thanks so much for, for having me. I'm, I'm looking forward to, to our chat here. Awesome. And before we dive into today's topic, um, I always like to have the audience get to know you a little bit. So maybe you can share your background, both as an athlete, so I know you are an athlete and you're a therapist, um, just so everyone can get to know you a little bit better. Sure. So I grew up um, playing a variety of sports when I was younger, um, had an affinity like like uh, many of us do. Um, really loved baseball. And that was kind of my sport. I um, had aspirations to play in college, or at least that was the plan. And then my senior year of high school, I had a shoulder injury, um, which really was not in the cards or, or the plan and uh, corresponding shoulder surgery thereafter and, and went to college in a sling um, and then tried to rehab and kind of come back from that. I was a left-handed pitcher and mm -hmm. um, really was unable to do so and needed to hit the eject button quite prematurely. Um, from kind of my my hopes and plans for just um, continuing to to play competitive sport, that process was really um, challenging for me in a multitude of ways. And I just in going through it, thought, man, it would be um, wonderful to be able to have the opportunity to support athletes in in a variety of ways. And um, changed my major. I was, I was an accounting major for one semester. Um, um, pivoted to psychology. Um, and then kind of continue thereafter with um, kind of a, a graduate training in sports psychology um, and then counseling psychology as well. Um, and always knew I wanted to work with athletes and the, and the psychological skills, mental performance training was always resonated with me just as an athlete, um, but also uh, was really drawn to kind of more of the clinical issues that, um, that athletes experience and, and felt like um, it would feel a bit disjointed to me if I could address the performance issues and have to refer to a clinical provider. So, so nobody is a, is a one-stop shop for everything, but I just mm -hmm. wanted to kind of get additional training. Um, and so I did that um, in graduate school and throughout my, my uh, grad studies, I, I coached a running uh, runners and triathletes in New York City um, and have been coaching off and on for, for 20 years or so. And um and then kind of transitioned to more endurance sports myself uh, and, and have enjoyed triathlon and running um, prior to having kids. And I'm, a diff I'm in a different season of life now. How old are your loving. kids? Um, they are uh, almost four, uh, four next month, five and six. So, Ooh. Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah. That's close together. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Awesome. Um, and of course, you know, one of your specialties is eating disorders. And I'm curious kind of what drew you to that? Was it was there any personal experience or kind of sure. what led you there? Yeah, it's a great question. So it was kind of really just um, um, luck, to be honest with you. I had a peer in graduate school. We do, you know, three, four years of internships or externships and, and, and placements and practicum to get supervision. Mm -hmm. And one of my one of my uh, peers had um, sought uh, a year of their practicum at a, an outpatient eating disorder treatment facility in New York City. 
And as, as luck would have it, it was about um, 100 yards from my campus at Fordham University at Lincoln Center. And so it was mm -hmm. very convenient. And the population, I was just kind of intrigued. And I thought this would be interesting. I don't have any training specifically in this area. And, and immediately, I was just really drawn and had just such a heart for individuals um, struggling uh, with this illness uh, and just the multitude of layers that kind of come with it in terms of um, mood disturbances, um, um, identity, interpersonal relationships, trauma. Um, there were just so many facets and layers. And as I was um, um, experiencing that training opportunity, I was also in the midst of kind of coaching athletes and I saw a lot of overlap just naturally. Um, and so that just made sense. And as um, as things would have it, I was finishing up my my graduate studies. I went back for a second year of training specifically in 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 my grad school training for eating disorders, and I knew I wanted to specialize in this population. And as luck would have it, um, at right as I was finishing up um, and graduated, the the victory program in at McCollum Place was just opening up, and it was the first residential treatment facility in the country for athletes, mm -hmm. and um, it was like almost, it was like the perfect kind of intersection for me. Mm -hmm. And um, so I, I applied for the job. I, I was thankful enough to get the job. Ron Thompson and Roberta Sherman are kind of pioneers in the field, of course. And Dr. McCollum was such a, a visionary to to create kind of a unique specialized um, treatment um, for athletes. And so I moved to, to St. Louis, Missouri and um, uh, was the director of the Victory Program for about eight years and, and learned an awful lot just in, in the intensive treatment world uh, and collaborating with other wonderfully skilled um, providers across the country, uh, collaborating on the care of athletes uh, and, and learned an awful lot and continue to do so. And then in conjunction with that, I've had my outpatient practice, mind, body, endurance for the past um, 11 years or so and um, have really kind of specialized in general with just athlete mental health. Um, mm -hmm work with athletes for performance concerns, but, but certainly specialize with eating concerns and eating disorders um, as well. So, And that's, that's of course the... how I found you when I had my own clients um, who were in need of um, some, you know, mental health support with, uh, you know, eating disorders and just sports stuff generally and found you guys and got in touch with Becca and just, yeah, so you're a whole great practice. I've, I've referred many people to you, which has been yes. great. Um, Okay, so let's get into today's topic now, which, as I mentioned offline, it's going to be a little bit of a mental health grab bag, <laughs> to be honest, because sure. there's just so much to talk about. And um, and as I was saying before we started, you know, I'm, I'm kind of going into this with a little bit less structure than I normally do, because I'm really curious to see where this conversation flows. Um, and there's just so much to talk about in you know, when it comes to mental health and athletes, and especially as it relates to nutrition and how that mm -hmm. kind of all intersects, as you were just talking about. I thought maybe a good place to start might be to talk about like fear and anxiety and how these things often lead to resistance when it comes to fueling adequately. And this can, of course, be like fear of weight gain or fear of poor performance, failure, fear of GI issues, that's a big one in people I see, um, or whatever else. And, you know, I, I know in my practice, I see a lot of people who are really struggling to to eat because, well, number one, they're often confused and getting conf conflicting advice, but mm -hmm. maybe they're afraid to eat certain things and may not feel good. The weight gain piece is so, so tricky and so common. And so there's just like so much fear and anxiety. And I see this, you know, in athletes who are both struggling with eating disorders and disordered eating, but also who are not. So mm -hmm. I know every situation is different, but maybe we can talk a little bit about how you handle and treat this type of fear and anxiety in your athletes, or maybe you can just speak to this more generally, if that's a little too tricky to answer. No, it's a great question. Yeah. Maybe I'll start just a, a couple of thoughts, which just more, more generally, maybe yeah. in, in my experience, just how... I um, kind of conceptualize fear and then kind of, mm -hmm. kind of anxiety in these areas that you mentioned more broadly, and then maybe how it perhaps maybe show, shows up with more dis disordered eating and yeah. you know, eating disorders, perhaps. Perfect. Um, so I think the uh, I, I think there's many facets to fear, and I, I, I certainly don't want to oversimplify um, that by any by any lens. But my experience is that sometimes fear is generated um, as a result of like ambiguity, uncertainty, and the unknown. Um, mm -hmm. And I, th I think that's oftentimes where anxiety kind of lives. It's a future-focused emotion oftentimes um, that 
that oftentimes, like for a lot of athletes, either they are asked are, are being told um, by by a, by a competent provider, by research that that perhaps some changes need to be made. If that's nutritionally, frequency of fueling, adequacy, types of you know food that they're eating, um, that just is different, right? And so sometimes in life, when things are different or or, or we're, we're being asked to do something different, that can evoke s- s- some anxiety and some worry um, mm-hmm. because I. We're creatures of habit, and I think um, things that are familiar and comfortable are are really desirable for us because they're predictable, even if they're maladaptive. And I think sometimes uh, fear and anxiety can be elicited when we're kind of stretched outside of that kind of window of tolerance. Uh, and, and so I think there is maybe, like you said, some some resistance or hesitancy at times. I, I, I in general, I find athletes to be highly courageous. And they'll roll up the sleeves and like, let's, yeah. let's do it. Right. Yeah, and, and totally. So this isn't Absolutely. Ac- this isn't across the board, but I think in some domains, specifically nu- nutritionally, that, that is something that is elicited. I'm curious in your experience, like how you see it show up um, as well, just like w- when you're trying to kind of um, provide some guidance, recommendations mm-hmm. or science, you know, in, into your interventions and yeah. And reaction. Yeah. I mean, I think some, I mean, sometimes I get people who are just so like at a loss, they're just willing to try anything and they're Mm -hmm. just like, okay, well, it can't be worse than what it is now. So let's just go for it. Other times people are, you know, just, yeah, as you said, like really just willing to go for it and just like, yeah, let's give this a go. Let's try it. Other times it's like contingent on something like, yeah, this is great. I feel great. But wait, now I'm gaining weight. I don't want to, no, nope, this isn't good anymore. Nope. Don't want to do this. So it's like, yes, I'll, I'm all for it. Only if these X, Y, Z things don't happen or do happen sure. or whatever. So it's, it's complicated. I think it's, it's complicated and fear of the unknown control. Like these are all things we also know to be very much tied into eating disorders and disordered eating. So it's, yeah, it's complicated for sure. Sure. No, I think I think what you said was um, is kind of my experience too. With just um, also, I think fear can be elicited when there's been maybe like a traumatic experience, mm-hmm. like, like with anything, right? So, like yeah. let's say you're trying to get an athlete to maybe fuel more appropriately in the hour or two or half hour before their workout, mm-hmm. right? And and perhaps in the past they maybe tried to do that, but like had massive GI issues, or yeah. you know, yeah. Um, the, Rightly so. That's a, that's distressing and traumatic. And so being asked to do something similar, um, again, will elicit oftentimes like um, worry, anxiety, and fear. Um, mm-hmm. And I think also times too, there there can be times like earlier in life or, or seasons of life, you know, that that perhaps some of our athletes have experienced, maybe in in different um, body shape sizes as well. That that like is connected and fused with. Um, um, quality of life, emotional experiences too. And I, and so I do think there is some traumatic experiences, um, uh, too, that an athlete has experienced in a variety of ways that can also el- contribute to, to that, such a response, maybe when in, in, in treatment, when we're asking them to make changes or they, or they just need to, um, to optimize health or, or sport performance, uh, yeah. too. I, I think in the context of eating disorders, um, I do think that fear is oftentimes driving the bus. Like, yeah. like I, I absolutely do. I don't think a lot of the athletes I work with, I would not um, uh, kind of describe them as fearful individuals in the least bit, but but I think in the context of this illness, um, fear is, is oftentimes driving uh, decisions, behaviors. It's um, creating this kind of like closed mindedness, rigidity. Um, I think something that we, I, I know you work, diligently towards and, and I certainly do too is to really foster like curiosity. I think curiosity is a highly um admirable trait for human beings in general. Um there's like an openness, there's a receptiveness. And we as providers try and try and cultivate that, right? And I mm-hmm. um I think you can grow and learn about yourself and have insights and, and make make changes and adapt when there is this curiosity. I find though that in the context of if or when anxiety or fear is present or self-criticalness or judgment, right? It, it squashes that curiosity. So they can't yeah. coexist. And and so I, I think I find myself really trying to um, kind of the, the phrase, like, I wonder is a, is a helpful kind of a bridge to, um, huh, I, wa- I wonder what's going on in my body right now. I'm feeling really activated, right? There's no judgment. 
you're honoring and acknowledging and validating your experiences. But but that oftentimes is it absent when fear and anxiety is kind of very, very present, I think, just in general. Yeah. Yeah. So when you're treating someone, are you then like really focusing on that fear and anxiety piece and trying to kind of calm that piece down so that the curiosity can come out? Or how are you kind of handling that? Absolutely. I think so. Absolutely. That's a goal. I think first I try to understand like what, what, um, what's behind the fear and anxiety. Can you play out that tape in your mind as to how you think things will unfold or maybe past experiences that have contributed? Cause I want to understand and not make assumptions as to why mm-hmm. this individual in this domain, we're asking you to not do additional workouts, right? Like what's getting kicked here? Like what's the worry? Um, because I, I want to have a rich understanding from, from an athlete standpoint um, uh, through their words as to what's contributing to the fear. And how, when did this fear start? Like, have you always been fearful, even at like age seven? Um, or has this been a more recent kind of phenomenon in this way? And so kind of, you know, we talk about like kind of like those um, like life narratives, mm-hmm. um, but narratives too, as a provider in their relationship with food, um, sport, <laughs> But but also emotions too, I think can be helpful. Like has has this been long standing? Um, kind of this disposition? Um, or is this kind of in this certain context, like like competition or this season of the year? Or um yeah, so I, I think it's trying to get a rich understanding of how the fear has presented, how long it's been present, but then also too, yeah, trying to 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 um then inform interventions thereafter about how can we really push into this and, and self-soothe, challenge the fear appropriately, mm-hmm. um, as opposed to uh, avoid. I think human nature, we want to avoid distress and discomfort. Yeah. And I think about fears in other domains, like um, some people have profound fears of like flying, right? And so mm-hmm. naturally you try to minimize, you know, that, that situation. So you can do that for a, a couple months, a couple years even, but if you've avoided like getting on a plane for a couple decades, and you've taken other behavioral, you know, you've, you've maybe ridden trains, um, you've driven, you know, it, to, to avoid this fear evoking situation, man, that really solidifies that fear and actually intensifies the fear because now so much time has passed and you've taken efforts to avoid it. So, so it actually is paradoxical because the very thing you're trying to avoid a fear evoking situation or internal experience or weight or whatever it might be actually intensifies the fear too, which, um, mm-hmm. so, so I think it's helpful through that lens to maybe reflect like, oh, it makes sense that you've really, you know, taken vast efforts to limit your carbohydrate in, intake for the last two years. And then you're being told like, we need to ramp that up just so you have available glycogen, you know, whatever it might be. And then boom, up pops like this <laughs> tremendous worry. Yeah. Yeah. And it's so much harder with food because you just can't avoid it. So you sure. can't just avoid that for two, for two decades. Exactly. Um, it's a little more complicated. I'm curious if like, what are the common themes that you see when it comes to fear, like fear of this, or this is going to happen when, when you work with athletes, I'm sure there's a wide range of things, but I'm sure there are some kind of very general common things you see as well. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. That's a great question. So I, I think, um, Sometimes like fear, fear of failure, but also fear of success. And I know that sounds strange, Ooh, but, but sometimes my athletes, um, extremely high achieving, motivated, committed perfectionism off the chart. But sometimes, um, if they reach, if, or when they reach some standard of performance, then it's like, oh gosh, I gotta, I gotta continue this. <laughs> yeah. and, and it's not necessarily fear of success, but it's like maintaining that or mm-hmm. exceeding that, that I think sometimes is fear evoking and just seems completely daunting, right? Um, yes, fear of fear of failure. What will that mean to me as a human being? My What will others think? What does that mean for my scholarship, my financial livelihood and my sport? Um, so that's very present. Um, I think sometimes it's just the fear of the unknown or ambiguity, again, is a big one, just generally. Mm-hmm. Um, I think, too, sometimes fear of... Um, like like emotional distress. I think athletes are super resilient in term often in the physical resolve and persistence and being able to endure an awful lot physiologically and physically in the context of sport. I think sometimes 
emo- there are certain emotions that we all have where like that our threshold is a bit low or underdeveloped. Yeah. Right? <laughs> yeah. And so sometimes if that threshold is it might be anger for some people, um it it, it could be um um despair, it, it could be sadness, it could be anxiety, whatever it might be. And sometimes there's a fear of like if or when that threshold gets exceeded, like just to- tolerating <laughs> Um, and mm-hmm. not feeling able or competent to, mm-hmm. to tolerate a distressing internal state. Um, sometimes there's oftentimes fear of making adjustments to training plan. Um, mm-hmm. So just change. Work- Absolutely. Or or <laughs> deviating. Or this work. My coach mm-hmm. gave me this workout today. Like, and I'm not doing it. <laughs> I always do my workouts. Like, what does this say about me? Fear of fitness um, deteriorating. By missing a workout or taking any time off or deviating from the training plan, injury, sickness, illness. Mm-hmm. Um, perhaps there's there's fear of maybe um, if we're trying to have more freedom and flexibility with um, with food. There's a there's maybe a fear of like what what if I um, can't stop? What what if, what if I like these foods too much and I can't regulate? You know mm-hmm. myself. Um, so that's often very present. I'm sure you're. Yeah, experience that yeah on most the daily. definitely. With, yeah. So these fears you're describing, um, I'm not sure your population, if it consists of, I mean, I'm sure, I know you work with recreational and elite, right? Mm-hmm. Like, would you say that these fears are more, are kind of for both populations or do you tend to see them more in like recreational versus kind of more elite athletes? I think it kind of transcends all. I, I have yeah. kind of the full spectrum of adolescent um high school, college, elite, professional Olympic athletes. And I think I, mm-hmm. I see it kind of show up yeah. similarly and a little bit differently, I think, in um, in both. I do think there sometimes is, you know, a, a perception and there, and there's some truth in this too. There's there's less margin for quote unquote error, I think, as, mm-hmm. as competition level increases. So I think sometimes what might accompany that reality <laughs> um <laughs> is is maybe feeling like i've got to ratchet things up like like and really um be even more regimented and more Mm -hmm. uh uh, deviate less because of that reality that competition level or skill has increased so i don't know if there's so much writing on it and like every little fraction of every second counts and all that yeah for sure Sure. um i got a, a question from a listener and this was in response to becca's episode on reds but i think it very much uh, relates to what you do and what we can talk about here. Um, and she was asking how lifestyle stress contributes to underfueling, overtraining, and reds. And I was kind of curious about, you know, the best ways of combating this and just your thoughts on this. Um, you know, I have my own ideas, but I'd love to hear yours. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I think, um, yeah, view view individuals as as people first and foremost, and then athletes very secondary. Um, yeah, of course, but. I, I do think kind of nothing occurs like in, in isolation and, and nothing is siloed and compartmentalized in ways that I think we like to think that we can mm-hmm. and, and that it kind of bleeds over. And so I think, like you said, that uh, with the question is lifestyle stress absolutely affects us in ways known and some some ways unknown. And sometimes, you know, everyone has a similar and different way of responding to stress. Um, but I oftentimes think specifically with like Reds, I'm sure Becca touched on this too, is that sometimes there is this, um, and again, this is a generalization, but oftentimes in, in a state of stress can be in a kind of mute hunger cues, right? And just what yeah. your body needs and that, and your body mm-hmm. still, still needs an awful lot, but your awareness to it in a state of stress yeah. might not be as attuned. Or just distraction um, even. It's like, it could, it mm-hmm. could not even be just stress. It could just be like, you're so zoned into whatever you're doing. Life exactly. distraction, but yeah. Mm-hmm. Very true. So yeah, distraction or just stress broadly can kind of yep. do hunger cues. Um, and then also, so that that's a contributing factor, of course, to, to kind of a, a reds, right? Mm-hmm. Kind of, but mm-hmm. then coupled with that, and there's some some evidence to support the utility of like activity and exercise can, can be stress re- reducing, right? Like, so mm-hmm. there is this, that reality. So, so the combination maybe of, of the athletes that we see that are vulnerable kind of in this space with more, more reds eating disorder are, are maybe um, more apt to kind of veer in, in, in those ways, just with that vulnerable, vulnerable kind of disposition. 
Um, and so the combination of that, perhaps of maybe in states or season of life where there is more stress, where you have combination of simultaneous, like low awareness to hunger cues, or maybe not being as attuned to what your body needs from a, from a nutrition standpoint, and maybe an over-reliance on kind of activity to self-soothe, um, to calm kind of distress really kind of poses a, a, a notable, um, constellation there to that athletes, you know, um, might experience to heighten kind of that, that vulnerability or deepen kind of that state of low energy availability. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and it's always, um, I mean, I know I always tell my athletes when it comes to handling stress and coping mechanisms more generally that like exercise cannot be your only tool. I just had a, this conversation with an athlete yesterday um, and we kind of go through all the different things that you can do instead. And then thinking about, well, okay, we can't always rely on hunger cues to eat mm -hmm. because yeah, sometimes you are really, and this, I mean, this is for all athletes, but I think especially recreational athletes who are just trying to squeeze it all in and they're doing a million things. Um, and yeah, they're just not always paying attention. And then even sometimes there are people who are very, very active who may not even consider themselves quote unquote athletes. Right. And, mm -hmm. but they're super, super active and absolutely could get reds. Um, so I think it's a, it's a, it's an interesting thing to think about. Um, and where I want to go a little further in with this is this whole concept of exercise as a stress reliever, but the fact that it also is a physical stress in the body. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious if you have anything more to say about that or how you kind of speak to that with your clients or just anything else you want to say there. Sure. So yeah, for, for the Stress reliever. I think I do think it can be it can be an effective stress reliever for for some, right? And um, that's okay. But like you said, if, it, if it's like the only way that you alleviate stress, I think that becomes quite problematic. Um, and I I think the big thing with athletes to try to frame is like really just setting appropriate expectations. And like my hope, my intent is not to try to convince you that doing anything else outside of um, exercise, whether it's like reading a book talking to a loved one, um, having a candle lit and just having, you know, a, wh whatever it might be that like is soothing is supposed to replicate your experience yes. in the context of exercise. Cause <laughs> it won't, it, won't cut it. <laughs> it's not, and it's going to yeah. be ethically disappointing and frustrating yeah. and you're not going to get a lot of buy-in. It's like, this didn't work. Yeah. And yeah, uh, yeah. it's not supposed to replicate. Yeah. We're not trying to do that. We're just trying to broaden your ability and skill set to, to regulate body, brain, self-soothe, you know, in, in addition to the, so it's not just like in case of emergency, break glass and rip off a workout, right? Like, yeah. like we, we do have to kind of um, expand kind of our, our ability to regulate um, that. Um, so, so with that said, I do think there's, there's that. I also think with, with kind of athletes, I always go back to the science, right? And as a coach myself, I know the science and a lot of athletes and coaches absolutely do in terms of periodized training, right? And if you think about periodized training, um, there's a lot of science behind that. You have different phases mm -hmm. of training. You have a you have a base phase, you have build, you know, you have peak, taper, race, recover, right? And you can repeat that a few times in a season, a few times. Mm -hmm. With athletes that maybe are overly reliant or have an unwholesome relationship with movement, oftentimes um, they are deviating and adding on training from perhaps like what coach is giving them. And I don't know about you, but I've never, uh, and I know Becca said this too, I've never met a coach who undertrains their athletes. They just uh, yeah. haven't met, met one yet, yeah. right? So, yeah. 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 <laughs> so the assumption is that coaches know the science and they're trying to get their athletes to peak at the op opportune times in the context of their season. But if and when you have an athlete who is maybe overly reliant on, on exercise for a variety of reasons, right? To be, to, to, to justify eating and intake, um, uh, to regulate stress, emotions, that, and they're adding on additional workouts, they're blowing up this periodized training plan. Mm -hmm. So their, their training is no longer periodized. Um, and I just think that's helpful because I do think athletes are oftentimes highly motivated for performance and to, to optimize performance. But I just think that's a helpful kind of construct. And oftentimes it's well-intentioned, you know, but in the context of periodized training, it, it is no longer periodized if you're doing additional above and beyond. Um, with that said, I also work with a lot of athletes, I know you do as well, whose performance is deteriorating and mm -hmm. they're in this injury cycle and they're actively aware that maybe their eating activity 
habits are, are like, or behaviors are contributing to this. And I think that's where like the mental health piece comes in. Is that with an ease or this is a mental health condition. And despite the awareness that my performance is not improving, I'm having a decreased response, training response. I mean, this injury cycle, like, like that's not a, enough to flip a switch and be agreeable, able, willing to consistently make changes also. So I think that's helpful too, is that performance can and be a motivator and be leveraged as a provider during treatment. It can, but oftentimes it's not sufficient if, if there's an active eating disorder present too. Yeah. Yeah. And the th uh, thing I'd like to add to that is like when someone's not working with a coach, let's say someone's doing a bunch of Peloton workouts or like I had a new client yesterday who is just doing nothing but high intensity workouts almost every sure. single day, you know? So again, this is why I keep coming back to the recreation athlete. Cause like, I feel like sometimes it's not that they're overlooked necessarily or that I'm not, nothing's like less or more important or whatever, but Mm -hmm. Again, some of these people, again, don't call themselves athletes and they're just in, there's, it's such high risk behavior, what they're doing. Mm -hmm. And it's so detrimental. And, um, and yeah, we, I mean, so this client who is new to me, you know, six to seven days a week, super high intensity workouts, under fueling, like not training for anything specific, not working with, like, you know what I mean? So it's like, oh, wow. And then we identify all the stuff. It's like, and we were exactly, we were talking about periodized training. We were talking about switching things up, taking easy days and all this stuff. And um, I think it's really easy, especially when people are doing orange theory or doing these high intensity classes, sure. they feel like they need to get that sweat and that burn and all that stuff to just like push too hard all the time. Mm -hmm. And then I think you add on top of that, this desire to look a certain way or, you know, lose weight or whatever it is. Or I think the toughest, one of my toughest populations, and I don't know about you, but I, I, well, I think there are a lot of tough populations, but <laughs> like a really tough population is like perimenopausal women who are like struggling with so many changes going on. Sure. And, you know, so it, it's, it's, it's really tricky is what I'm trying to say. I know for myself as a young athlete working with a coach, whenever my coach would give me options and it would be like a pace range or a mile range, I would do the hardest, fastest <laughs> thing on there and then would maybe take it a little too far. Um, and I would feel that, you know, so it's, it's over time I've learned to be a smarter athlete and to really respect my body and know when taking a day off or pulling back or whatever is, is the thing to do. But of course, as you said, like the more disordered relationship or unhealthy relationship with food, with body, with exercise, that's where it's really hard to be able to do those things, you know, yes. so it's really tricky. <laughs> None of this is easy. It, it very much is. And I think like, yeah, to speak to your, the recreational athletes that um, there, I, I kind of try to get a good sense of like, where, um, where's the end goal here? Like, where, where are we going? Mm -hmm. Like, what, what are, to kind of crystallize it? Because it sometimes is just feels like they're on a hamster wheel and it's just like wash, yes. rinse, repeat, you know, wash, yes. rinse, repeat. And this is just what I do. And there's really not, it's not goal directed, perhaps it's just the ambiguousness. Like, I just want to get faster. <laughs> okay. <laughs> But yeah. like until like indefinitely, like, like, like for in two months, like what, what are we, so I, I find myself kind of trying to crystallize and firm up a little bit because otherwise they're on this perpetual treadmill that is never, you know, individual can never feel compelled or able to get off mm. and it just is relentless. Right. So it's like lacking, lacking, um, uh, goal, goal directedness, um, lacking kind of structure and a framework. And it's kind of just monotonous and there's not a lot of variety and variation. It's just hammer, mm -hmm. hammer, hammer, or I just do this much on the bike or uh, it's static, right? And it's not malleable and changing, which a, which a thoughtful, scientifically based training plan should be um, too. So I think for recreational athletes, yes, there is resources needed to kind of hire a coach. Um, not all coaches are maybe attuned and sensitive. I think the coaches that I have admired and respected over the years really get to know their athletes. And I find myself like pulling... <laughs> athletes back. I don't need to motive. I don't need to mm -hmm. push them. It's actually yeah. like pulling them back um, quite a bit because left to their own vices. And a lot of athletes I work with, they, they, they know this about themselves and they have wisdom about, about this, like um, maybe vulnerable tendency to, to, and so coaches are kind of like guardrails a little bit or providers are guardrails because left to my own vices. I, I think I, I would overextend, you know, myself and have done so in the past. And, and there's mm -hmm. a lot of risk that comes with that. Yeah. Um, I want to move to body image next. Um, such a tough one for everyone, athletes included. I actually did an entire episode on this <laughs> and um, 
which was well received. But um, yeah, I it's it kind of goes with the whole theme of change to some degree because we know that obviously <laughs> there's nothing stopping the aging process and the changes that go with sure. growing up and all the stuff that happens in our life. Um, and change is hard and, and kind of, you know, and like referencing back to that, like perimenopausal time for many women, that's such a hard time. I mean, there's so many times that are hard for people, whether it's going through puberty or pregnancy or just whatever it is. Um, women and women go through a few more of these changes, but, Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I'm curious how you work on improving body image with your athletes, um, and kind of what tips and strategies you can recommend. Oh yeah. It's a, it's a a big one. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> I won't, I won't do it justice, but I'll, I'll, I'll just give some thoughts that maybe come to mind. Um, I, I, again, kind of there, there's an individualized nature to all this and in this construct and how an individual experiences their own body and thoughts and feelings that, that kind of come in, um, with, with that. So I would want to know, um, uniquely for whatever athlete I'm working with, like, how does, how do you experience your body and body image is contextual. So Given given the, the the domain or situation we're in, it can change. It's not, oftentimes not this static entity. So um, some days, body image and stress might not be even present. Right? Mm. Some days you might feel really secure and confident um, in your body, and other days there might be just more criticism and judgment in comparison to your you know to yourself in the past or others presently. So I think it's very fluid, and sometimes in the context of sport. Um, that's very present. Um, an athlete might feel, think, uh, experience their bodies in one way, and then outside of sport, more socially, might have different experiences mm-hmm. too. So I, I just think it's helpful to kind of think about that, yeah, um, as well, and how it shows up and how it presents, and then too, like how interfering kind of it is on on them. Um, I, I just spoke with an athlete right before our, my, uh, you know, jumping on here, and and she like has this relentless. Um, kind of awareness about what other people's bodies look like in relation to hers. And it really mm-hmm. just is like perpetual and very interfering just in her daily life. And it's really interfering. Um, I do think kind of, I think about body image as like this continuum, like a lot of things, emotions mm-hmm. are all somewhere on this continuum mm-hmm. at all times. Um, it's not categorical as either, oh, I love my body or eh, no, not at all. <laughs> it's, it's, we're somewhere. And so that from an intervention standpoint, understanding, I think that informs me in terms of how, how to try to support athletes in, in this way. So I think about, um, you know, there is this, uh, I think notion whereby, um, you know, like love your body is kind of this message that, that some of our athletes get hammered with. And they it's like, yeah, you should, I know I should love my body, but I just don't or whatnot too. And I, I think that can feel really discouraging for some of the athletes that we work with that are just really at a different place, unfortunately, mm-hmm. with how they think and feel about themselves as a person, but also how they experience their body. So I think about this and trying to work with like, well, is it maybe more possible for you to, um, we can work towards interventions to how to better like tolerate your body at times, at times, um, tolerate the distress, tolerate the discomfort. Um, cause sometimes that's, that's what is needed. We got to meet you where you're at. Um, and so interventions would look like that. And then other times individuals like, no, it's really hard. I don't even think I can tolerate my body and I haven't been able to. So, um, and then moving on that continuum, okay, well, um, would it be possible for you to work towards more of an acceptance of your, of your body? And this is kind of like the radical acceptance, uh, uh, term kind of in, in, in therapy we use in in DBT. Mm -hmm. It's, it's this notion whereby you can have thoughts and feelings about a lot of things and you can kind of radically accept this is where I'm at, or this is a situation that's here. Could, can you accept something that you have a hard time tolerating much less loving? And that's kind of some athletes can some, no, I still can't. And and that would inform kind of from an intervention standpoint. And then I think on the other end of the continuum, which is where the place that I think probably we center on is this notion whereby can um, kind of caretaking for your body. And I, I don't know about you, but I think this is a much more doable and achievable, still challenging objective, just in treatment or working with athletes. But caretaking can look like a lot of different ways. You can caretake for something that in theory, you, you know, uh, have a hard time tolerating, um, accepting, much less loving. Mm-hmm. But but sometimes that takes just a behavioral piece of of despite how you think and feel about or experience your body, we're asking you behaviorally or this is needed, right? 
that's a hard thing because human nature, we oftentimes behave in a way that is a byproduct of how we think and feel. <laughs> so the two are one. But if you think about it for an athlete who maybe has high body image distress or criticism or judgments towards their body, if their behaviors follow suit and that plays mm -hmm. out with their food choices or how much they're eating and exercise, it really just kind of solidifies the feelings that are quite unwholesome about their body. So that's a very oversimplified lens. I'm curious, like, how do you work with, with athletes too, with that maybe exhibit just high body image distress? And Yeah. I mean, there are a number of things. I mean, I think just kind of peeling back the layers of why, I mean, I talked, I mean, a lot of what you talked about, the spectrum of how, of all this, you know, we kind of talked through that. Um, there are kind of some strategies about, you know, we talk about what's comfortable, you know, mm -hmm. the clothing's a big piece of it, like what's comfortable sure. to them and, and, um, trying to explore that. Um, you know, there are a lot of people who are just so weight centered. So when we talk about body image, it's almost, well, not all the time, but it's often tied to a weight. Sometimes people will say, I don't care about the weight. I just, none of my clothes fit and I feel miserable and uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. Um, and so we kind of dig into, well, what is comfortable? What might be comfortable? Like, how can we help you be comfortable now as we kind of work through these things? Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's really tricky. It's really tricky. And, and it comes back to so often for at least my clients, it just comes back to weight or body size so mm -hmm. often and kind of exploring what that means to them and why it's important and why they feel they need to be the certain way or, you know, maintain this weight or, you know, and then also just navigating the change, which it's never just the weight, you know, it's sleep and it's mood. I mean, there's just so many changes that are happening. So it's, it's tricky. It's, it's very tricky. And, and as you said, it's very yes. individual. So I, um, I wonder for you, you know, when you're talking about different interventions to kind of mm -hmm. help tolerate one's body, like what might be an example of an inter sure. intervention just to kind of yeah. you know, get a sense of that. Today's episode is brought to you by my virtual practice, Eat for Endurance. I'm not sure if you visited my website recently, but I just added a digital resource page that includes six free different downloads on a wide range of nutrition topics. So if you haven't checked those out yet, go grab them now over at eatforendurance.com. Whether you're struggling with low energy, GI issues, poor performance in training or racing, nutrient deficiencies, or you just want to crush your next athletic goal, I'd love to help you out. In addition to the low-cost digital downloads I offer, I also have a self-paced nutrition course called Peak Performance that you can check out on my website. I also offer small group coaching, and I have a few one-to-one -one coaching spots opening up later in October. If you have any questions, just email me at claire at eatforendurance.com, and if you are considering one-to-one -one coaching, I do offer free 10-minute discovery calls that you can book over on my site. All right, back to the episode. Yeah. So a couple come to mind. One is, um, can be like more like cognitive diffusion. So like when you're trying to diffuse sometimes like destructive thought patterns or emotions, mm -hmm. you're validating them. But so a cognitive diffusion strategy might be something to the effect of like this, like we just talked about that body image, um, is a fluid construct and there's beauty in that, um, because, um, it changes, it, um, intensity, how you feel. And, and I think there's value in that. So for example, for someone in, in the midst of just high body image distress or discomfort. I think there's value in accessing a time. Sometimes it's even earlier that day. Sometimes mm -hmm. it's yesterday. Like, wow, this was not even in my awareness. And I, I know factually my body really hasn't changed <laughs> dramatically. Um, mm -hmm. My awareness has really been exaggerated in, you know, in these parts of my body and I have strong feelings. It's really uncomfortable. But I also know that like this was off my radar or I was just a bit more accepting of my body yesterday. So yeah. Just even that awareness, and that's hard to access in that emotion, you know, that state, of course. But I think there's power because <laughs> in that when when emotions are really intense, it, it can feel like this is never gonna let up. This is gonna be relentless and enduring. But I, I think accessing a time sometimes not not so you know long ago where you felt just differently or more neutrality can be powerful, right? So that can be like a cognitive diffusion, um, yeah. um strategy too. Um, another uh. Uh, another intervention too. I think it. I think sometimes when there's discomfort in uh, in your body or there's body image distress, sometimes there can be either avoidance of of kind of like just even looking at yourself. Um, but but 
oftentimes there's like body, what we call body checking, which is. Yeah. I wanted to talk of, about that. <laughs> yeah. It's so what, common. Sure. Sure. And so sometimes this can be like a byproduct of body image distress or feeling insecure. And there, that can look a lot of different ways, but sometimes it's maybe just um, uh, putting your hands over certain areas of your body, um, literally body checking, or sometimes it can result like in looking at yourself in a, in a critical way or, or judgmental way in, in, in a mirror reflection of a store window. And mm. so I, I, th I think that can, or comparisons, you know, towards um, others. So, so this body checking can absolutely be a, be present. So kind of from an intervention standpoint to your question of what does that look like? I, I think they're um, one, you got to recognize maybe vulnerable um, spaces. So for some people that's like when I'm in the bathroom, I, I sometimes like linger after washing my hands and, and maybe look at myself in a way, you know, that is, is there and pretty critical and zeroes in on certain parts of my body. And so from an intervention standpoint, one, it's just recognizing those um, internal and external states that you are vulnerable to engage in that. And then two, to be really thoughtful and deliberate. And um, so it might be something as simple as, hey, I know the bathroom, I struggle with with that. And so um, when I'm washing my hands or when I'm in the bathroom or in front of me, I'm just going to maintain eye contact with myself. Um, it, it can be simple as that. Because if you're, I always think about if you're meeting somebody else for the first time and they're saying, hi, Claire, nice to meet you. And they're they're zeroing in on like your, your, your quads or your midsection. And they're just like talking to you. I mean, you'd, you'd be kind of freaked out, freaked <laughs> out right? Eyes up here. Yeah. Yeah. But you'd yeah. be really freaked out as you should yeah. be. And it'd feel really unsettling. It'd feel really unsafe. But, but in essence, like when, when it, when we body check or look at ourselves in the mirror yeah. in that way, it, it has the same, has the same mm -hmm. effect. So I think interventions yeah. like that can be helpful and align it and, and supportive, yeah. but yeah. Yeah. And the way I think about it is kind of thinking about like, what are the things that kind of trigger you? And it's the same thing. It's like, does looking in the mirror kind of cause that reaction? Or mm -hmm. I know in the other episode where we talked about body image, um, Holly, the other dietitian was talking about like one of her clients who had an amazing workout, like a great speed session, then came back and then kind of saw her image in the mirror and then suddenly doubted everything, you know? So it's, mm -hmm. it's, you know, um, how things can just change really rapidly. So what you're talking about is like going back and thinking back to those times where, you know, okay, well, what, what really happened here and how can I kind of change how, like, can I tweak these things so that I don't cause these triggers to happen and, sure. and these emotional responses. So I think it's so interesting. And the body checking thing is so interesting to me personally, because, you know, I have a history of eating disorder, well, it's never diagnosed, but uh, a long time ago and kind of a bad relationship with exercise in my early twenties. Mm -hmm. And and the body checking thing, it's its funny because like, even though I'm quote unquote recovered, which of course is a process itself sure, and a sure. continuum, um, you know, like I'll occasionally just like kind of not even think it, it's like almost instinctual or her habit or, and it's not all the time. Like I almost catch myself looking at my stomach or looking at my thighs mm -hmm. or something like that. And it's, and I don't really think much of it, but it's like, or I'll touch my stuff. It's, it's weird how these behaviors can be mm -hmm. so ingrained in you. And I guess the difference being that if I step on the scale or do this and that, or whatever it is, it doesn't elicit this emotional response. Like I couldn't care less. And yeah. that's the recovered part. <laughs> but sure. back yeah. when, obviously, it just, but it's funny how these little things kind of linger and just, mm -hmm. even though they're not frequent. So yeah, it was, I was, when I think about body checking, I'm like, oh, wow, I just body checked myself the other day. Like, yeah. why was I doing that? That's so <laughs> interesting. Like, it wasn't yeah. like, it wasn't intentional. It was bizarre. But anyways, just happened. that came yeah. to mind. Yeah, it's, it's interesting how these things can linger. Yeah. The, so. other, the, the other thing I think is helpful sometimes with body image specifically is mm. I think um, form versus function. And I think sometimes like when there's body image distress, there's like evaluation criticalness towards like mm -hmm. the shape or size yeah. or body comp um, yeah. too. But oftentimes I do think um, there's value in shifting that to like functionally um, – so I was talking with, with, with an athlete recently and she talked about like, I'm just like self-conscious about my, you know, um, about my quads and, and just the size of that and shape. And, you know, we talked about, and I, th I think like in, in, she gets in that kind of um, mindset where it's really self-deprecating, pretty critical and comparative, mm -hmm. but also <laughs> she's walking to work. And I said, well, like, I would imagine you're quite grateful that you have two legs and, and that like your, your legs can coordinate. And so you can walk to work. And she's like, of course, <laughs> I don't really think about that. Yeah. But I am. And so I think it's deliberately bringing our attention to that or, or my arms allow me to like 
hug my wife and kids. Wow, I that's priceless, right? And so I think sometimes implementing some genuine kind of gratitude for parts of your body that allow you to do what you uh, really are grateful for, um, that you appreciate activities, whatever it might be, I think can be a, a helpful shift a, a, a bit too um, in response to maybe some of the more evaluative comparative you know, uh, places that your mind can go in that state. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think sometimes, sometimes it's so hard though, because like we take all those things for granted or, yeah. I mean, I use we very broadly, obviously oh, yeah. not everyone has two legs and all these things, but, um, I know I certainly take a lot for granted mm -hmm. and it's only when I'm like injured or can't do something that suddenly I'm <laughs> like, um, yeah. like I have this little gratitude journal I have like every night and I'm like, I ran for four miles today. Hooray. <laughs> you know, it's, it's only when you really like lose something or can't do something that, unfortunately you appreciate it more so it is a good reminder kind of to to try to to practice like gratitude surrounding things that we do take for granted but you know really we shouldn't right i mean sure. especially as we get older and i'm sure everyone listening has you know you have people in your lives that you watch age and slowly can't do certain things that you know you and it's scary it's like just thinking about aging or things changing in your life and losing the ability to do certain things you love and um, yeah, I mean, I know when I'm talking with my clients about like goals and what we're working on, it's like, I think sustainable, like long-term things, like doing things for as long as you possibly can, mm -hmm. especially when it comes to sport, like that's guiding so much of our nutrition and exercise and how we take care of ourselves in theory and practice that doesn't always happen. <laughs> yes. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it's, uh, when I think about like that whole person first athlete second or human first athlete second mm -hmm. thing. Cause that's certainly what I say as well. That's what I think about. I think about, okay, rather than like focusing. So like, yes, your event is so important and your short-term goal is so important, but you know, what's more important the rest of your life. <laughs> yeah, Like that's more important is you being a healthy person who can do what you love for as long as possible. Mm -hmm. And protecting that and of course sure. if you're an elite sport you're not gonna be doing elite sport for the rest of your life so of course we are kind of prioritizing things these things in the short term but not at the expense of your long-term health like that's just yep. not worth it so yep. that's what that phrase means to me so I, mm -hmm. I i was going through some of your papers and i saw like one of them was titled person for athlete second i was like <laughs> oh that's awesome i like that <laughs> but that's what yeah. i see too yeah. um it's, so, yeah. it's helpful too to kind of think about like or know for your athletes like wh what do you feel like if you get to this end goal whatever the end goal might be mm -hmm. right fitness related if it's body weight body comp or whatever it might be like what do you what do you believe that'll deliver for you I'm curious because yeah. it's very alluring it's very captivating um, and you're relentlessly pursuing it right that and that might even be just like I just want to feel comfortable in my body okay so what would that mean for you? And, and it's just helpful to kind of think about it because sometimes they're like good things and, but, but they're ulti they're, they're made ultimate. And so there's this like relentless pursuit to get there. And usually body image distress is oftentimes displaced, meaning there's something else. And this is like, obviously the psychologist and me kind of coming through, but there, there's something else internally in terms of identity, um, perceived value and worth that is maybe, um, underdeveloped, um, that, that that's a, that's insecure. That's displaced on, kind of bo body, right? Like my body, th this is just the problem. Or if I could just fix this, then it'll feel like this. And I, I don't know, we've seen this kind of play out in a very public way in, in, in our, you know, society with maybe higher profile people where they feel like if they get to this status or this place or this income level or whatever it might be that then it's going to feel a certain way. And they relentlessly pursue it. And then if or when they get there and it, and they feel kind of similar, or it, it doesn't really deliver, man, that must just feel like a, very empty, crushing, demoralizing, you know, feeling, of course, how could it not? But I think sometimes yeah. it's important to understand what, what, what do you feel like this is going to give you like internally, or if you get there or when you get there, like what, what are we, what are we working towards here? And usually it's internal factors that are really, uh, you know, it's well-intentioned. They maybe are underdeveloped, but like just misguided and it's not exactly that translatable. That's what I feel like so much of like the weight loss conversation is. And it's not to discredit all weight loss, but yeah. so much of the time it's like, if only I could lose this weight, like mm -hmm. this, everything would be so much better in my life, you know? And it's like, well, would it though? <laughs> you know? So, so there's kind of like that aspect. And um, I mean, it's just, I, I keep coming back to weight because it's just such a huge theme, I'm sure. And many of the people you see as well. And it's something mm -hmm. certainly that Beck and 
I talked about a lot um, and in her course as well, like the Reds course. But um, yeah, the, the weight piece, it just like so often comes back to that. Mm-hmm. And it's really, really, really hard. And I have a client right now who, you know, is really struggling in her body and she gained like 15 or so pounds in, you know, perimenopause and is just super, super struggling. And it's, it's so hard with these things to kind of be like, okay, but you're not eating enough. And like, Hey, we still need to work on this. And I can't promise that you're going to lose the weight. And like, it's, you know, it's, it's one of these things yeah. where you just, I think as just an empathetic person, you want to just like, f- I'm going to fix this and take it away and make you feel better. And we're going to zap that, mm-hmm. you know, it's like, but no, that's not what's happening. That's not the thing. Sure. So I'm, I'm kind of curious how, and we're going to talk about eating disorders separately, although I know this is somewhat connected, but when it comes to the weight thing specifically, I'm kind of curious what thoughts you have or what you'd like to say on it. Yeah, I would, I would kind of want to know, like, how do they come to these preferences or ab- absolutes themselves, mm-hmm. if that's a certain yeah. weight or if that's, you know, a, a, a weight goals or um, how did you come to that? What, what Did someone tell you this? That was this self, like, kind of like a salad bar? Or it's like, I picked this from Instagram, this from TikTok. <laughs> and conjured up this influencer and I kind of yeah. cobbled it together, filtered it and it adopted it as my own. Okay. Mm. Um, is this like a narrative that maybe um, parents or loved ones have told you? Like, and so I, I would just want to know the genesis of it. Um, I feel like too. often it's, it's, I've always been this way and now I'm not. Yeah. I feel like so <laughs> often it's like, but I've, for my entire life, I was this way. And suddenly I'm going through these shifts, hormonal changes, whatever I'm going through. Mm-hmm. And I am suddenly not this way anymore. And I can't be at this way. I have to go back to the way it was. Yep. Because I'm miserable now. I can't be here. Exactly. Yes. Let's it's take so that different. example. <laughs> mm-hmm. it's, so it's different. Yes. It's maybe different. Mm-hmm. But is different necessarily bad? Human nature sometimes reflexively. Difference not good. Difference bad. Yep. Difference is different. We got to neutralize that, right? Like this, yeah. this is different. It's a different season of life. You comparing yourself to 15 years ago is not an apples to apples comparison. It's easy to do in sport, racing, weight. It's easy to do, but it's not an apples to apples comparison, but it can be so destructive and almost align and support too. I, I think with weight, sometimes there's this like contingent. I always think about like identifying contingencies that we all, we have sometimes on our perceived value, desirability, self-worth. Mm -hmm. And and really those are powerful, powerful things. And what oftentimes in therapy we're trying to do is identify those contingencies and we're really trying to deconstruct them because, because if you have a contingent self-worth or a contingent okayness, and if it is connected to weight or your fitness, man, that's going to be so challenging. I think about this, an example that I give is a silly one, but it's like if if my, my wife, who's absolutely wonderful and lovely, um, and the nicest person you'll ever meet, but like, if she were to say like, um, you know, you, you need to text message me like at least seven times a day or else we're done. I'd be like, well, that that's odd and weird. But like, like clearly that she's put a very yeah. discreet contingency on the status of our relationship. And you better believe that every single day I would feel quite unsettled to be like, how many times have I texted her? Three times? Oh no, I got to send out four more in the next two hours. And it would just be this unsettledness, restlessness. How could it not? Mm. Right? Yeah. And I think that's a silly example, but I think it translates and plays out sometimes similarly with individuals we work with and that they put some contingencies on whether that's productivity. Mm. Right? Oh, productive that one. oh my yeah. God. Yeah. <laughs> yes. I hate that word. I'm trying to eliminate it from my vocabulary. <laughs> right. <laughs> but so yes, I hear you. There's always, and I think weight can kind of be a, a really um, pronounced contingency that some of our mm. athletes put into their ability to be okay, accepting of themselves, desirable to others, perform well in sport, whatever it might be. And I just think, Mm. yeah. Yeah. No, it's, it's top of mind right now, just because I've, I've gotten it so frequently with clients, but also like I've, I just had two new clients, both with that same Mm. issue. So I'm like, oh yeah. Um, well, so speaking of weight, I mean, I've talked so much on this show about how weight is just one of many, 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 many different factors that affect performance. Mm -hmm. Nutrition, of course, is a huge factor. Um, but so is mental resilience. And I think we, we, you, you mentioned kind of resilience or mental fortitude, whatever, a little bit earlier, but, 
Um, and I know that's a pretty broad phrase, but I was kind of wondering if there are any practical tips or strategies or maybe just your general thoughts on it, things you can share with my audience to build mental strength as athletes in terms of, because I know like you work with eating disorders, but you're also a sports oh. psychologist. So mm -hmm. just in terms of like thinking about improving performance from this angle, again, emphasizing that it's not just weight. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. No, you're right. There's a multitude of other um, factors directly contributing to performance, of course. And yeah, resilience is one. Um, I think about resilience as like in, in adverse, uncomfortable conditions, kind of continuing to persist um, uh, consistently, right? And I mean, there's more, it's a more nuanced uh, definition yeah. than that, of course. But I think resilience, like it, it's easy to be res resilient or persist when all conditions are favorable and your performance is or life is mm -hmm. going well my mood's yeah. stable. And, and I mean, that's, that's not really resilience because that's not really in the face of adversity or, you know, opposition. Um, um, so I do think that like, I think athletes really have this quite, um, uh, this trait kind of well-developed oftentimes in aspects of their sport. <laughs> they kind of have to, if they excel and up, up the, sure. you know, competitive level and skill level. I think where there are sometimes is challenges is that sometimes is domain specific and not transferable to other parts like of life with resiliency. Um, mm -hmm. And so I'm kind of more strengths based. Yes, there are things that we, um, we we need to develop and cultivate, of course, but oftentimes there's a part of life where there is demonstrated resiliency, right? Whether that's tragedy personally, um, if that's academic, like learning dis disabilities and they've like persisted and kind of found a way to work and navigate that space academically, right? And are continuing to do so in college. Um, and kind of to bridge that in and kind of be like, well, how how did you <laughs> remain resilient and steadfast in this situation? Because that's really impressive. And then what kind of similar skills and abilities can we bridge over to right now? I think the, um, you know, you hear the phrase like um, uh, knowing and identifying your why I think is really important. Mm -hmm. um, and there can be multitude of whys. Why am I doing, why am I doing this? <laughs> like, um, why am I deliberately pushing myself beyond comfort or I, I'm, I'm really struggling with my performance. I'm really in a slump. Like, wh why am I continuing to show up and, and, and to kind of get after it? Um, that's a really anchoring thing because I think in the midst of, of disappointment or when performance isn't going well, or sometimes life is just a struggle. Like I, I do think kind of your anchor in the midst of those storms is to really come back to like your why. Um, and that can be like, one of my whys is like, I, um, just want to maximize my opportunities that I have. Cause I know they're finite, um, maximize my abilities. I want to fully leverage the support of people around me. That's my why. Um, I, um, my why is I just like love to challenge myself, right? A lot of our athletes do great. What we're asking you to do right now is super challenging, obviously, right? Um, <laughs> yeah. You like challenge, we can tap into that bucket all day long. So I, I think sometimes to foster resiliency is to come back to like, you know, your, your whys and what drives you. Because in, in like my introduction to sports psychology class a long, long time ago, kind of the question of motivation, like how do you motivate an athlete? Mm. Right. And the most simple answer, it's a powerful one that I found to be true over the years is you find out what they value. Find out what they value. Because if you're trying to motivate them in a way that is misaligned to what they value, it can actually be quite demotivating, right? And I think yeah, coming back to your why and really anchoring yourself and reminding yourself, um, I think can be powerful. Because if you're doing hard things with that's in therapy or, or sessions or in sport or life, um, and you can't access that, man, it just makes the resiliency, I think, quite challenging to kind of uphold um, if you're not yeah. able to remind yourself of why you're doing what you're doing. Um, Absolutely. To... And the only thing I'd, I'd add just as a little addendum to this is sometimes, especially I think in ultra endurance <laughs> the realm, um, we see people pushing, like they're so mentally strong, but mm -hmm. they're pushing to the point where they're like, there are times where like you should not stop. <laughs> you yeah, should yeah. just stop. Yes. And yes. yes, you could like push your body and you're so strong and that's so amazing. Great. But you are doing more harm than good. Um, and of course we, that's linked to overtraining, over exercising, not recognizing when pain is really destructive mm -hmm. and not health, you know, healthy and all of that. So like there is obviously a line at some point where 
like mental resilience oh. can be detrimental. Right. And like, like, yes, it's something we applaud and support and want to cultivate and build and all that. Mm -hmm. But also like there's, there is a, a line, there's a boundary where we have to be careful to cross, or, you know, we're crossing that. Yeah. I'm so glad you said that because that, that's where I think like um, we sometimes live in like grind culture, like just keep grinding. Mm -hmm. And sometimes, um, you know, uh, you know, pain, pain, pain is weakness leaving the body, you know, whatever yeah, it might be, God. it's just like, oh my Stay goodness. Stay hard. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> and so, so sometimes these messages can be hammered, whether it's coaches or messaging, yeah. but, but I also think athletes need to access wisdom. Like wisdom is so powerful. And, and sometimes wisdom is pulling back or, or, or adjusting, right? And it's not just the athletes that can hammer the hardest and longest that have longevity and consistency in sport. I would argue it's the athletes that are wise and know themselves and know past experiences and know science that that can use that to to inform them in the in the present moment. So it's I agree with you. It's not always keeping foot on gas pedal and hammering and pushing through um, at all because that, that, that's yeah, just re and reckless and misinformed. And not like celebrating running on like broken feet and yeah, whatever yeah. else. I mean like. Like, I actually, you know, I mean, I'm referencing David Goggins, but I mean, I actually listened to, to his two audiobooks and I actually enjoyed them. And there are, of course, very inspiring pieces from it, but like, oh. those aren't things we should be aspiring to. We shouldn't be aspiring to running on broken bones, letting sure. ourselves get to that point. We shouldn't be aspiring to starving ourselves and running for 24 hours. I mean, like, these aren't things like... Are they impressive? Like, I sure. Like, if you can suffer that much, great. Good for mm -hmm. you. But, like, <laughs> I, I don't know. I, these aren't things we really should be applauding. Um, sure. No. Anywho, that's an aside. Um, okay. I want to end with eating something on eating disorders. We're obviously, like, I mean, you could spend a million hours in eating disorders. So this isn't, I'm not at all trying to, like, <laughs> sum it all up or anything. We're not going in too deep because we're almost done here. But I wanted to ask are there things that are commonly misunderstood about eating disorders that you wish people knew that you wish people understood better or what do you want people to know about these mental illnesses? Yeah, no, there's, there's, Oh, we could, we could have a whole episode on. I know, on kind of that I know, I'm sorry. This, but, 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 but I think, no, I think it's a good question. Cause I think it's important. Um, Cause I think that sometimes eating disorders, unfortunately can be really misunderstood and misrepresented yeah. just in society our social circles and media. I, I think like one of the first one things that I guess maybe comes to mind is, is specifically with, with an athlete is that it, it is an effort and an attempt to maximize performance. I just think that's like, maybe sometimes, maybe sometimes that's the start or Genesis perhaps of making tweaks, you know, but that just, I think really oversimplifies it and just unfairly um, puts an athlete in that box that I think that does not account for the, complexities in, the, in this mental health condition that is like solely for their sport, right? Um, so I think there's a constellation of a genetic, um, it's like biopsychosocial model, right? Genetic kind of a temperament, disposition, and environment. All three are oftentimes at play to, to either manifest a physical vulnerability and or, or mental health, right? And so I think that's a big one uh, that it's like a, just a pursuit for excellence mm -hmm. in sport. And, and for some, it might be. Um, I, th I think too, the, the misperception, uh, I think too, is that maybe it's just all about the food <laughs> and, 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 yeah. and it is, but it isn't right. Like, so yeah. <laughs> it is, but it's like tip of the iceberg. There's so many other kind of layers below that. Maybe it's showing up in, in kind of ways that are dysregulated, you know, a, um, unbalanced relationship with, with food and movement and body, but, but it isn't like only, well, like we, we talk about a lot, right? Like, and I, I think like, if that was all that we talked about with, I mean, I, I think we would just want to bang our heads against the wall, like it, uh, collectively. It, and it's super important. I don't mean to minimize or trivialize any of that, but also it would do a huge disservice to just center and stay there. I think this has much to do with other pieces that we've talked about. I think oftentimes like quality or lack thereof of your relationship with yourself is a, is a big one, in my opinion. It's kind of the rudder of our ship in life mm -hmm. and sometimes needs to be addressed. There's trauma, mood disturbances, and, and all these other kind of co-occurring conditions too. So, so to attribute it to like, well, it's just, you know, with the food is absolutely important, vital. That's why you get paid the big bucks um, to provide support, you know, for athletes in this way. But, but, it, but it's, it's much broader than that too. Um, I think sometimes there's a, there's a myth that like, these are just simply choices and you need to choose better <laughs> or differently. <laughs> just to eat. Yeah. <laughs> 
Uh, I think yeah. it can be really insulting and just really minimizing um, and trivializing. And I think another myth, too, is that um, I think there can be oftentimes a false sense of wellness for, for, for many of the athletes that we work with because they're super high achieving. They're very like adept um, um, academically, professionally, relationally. High, yeah, high functioning. Yeah, yes. so you're functioning within a mental illness like very well. And sure. hiding things and being very creative about it. It's hard. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I'm guilty of this sometimes too. You see an athlete like performing well and there's an automatic assumption. That assumption. Yeah. In a place of wellness and health. And sometimes that's totally true. Absolutely. But the one thing I'm struck by, I don't know about you, but um, man, the human brain and body are so tremendously resilient. And even in a place of being unwell and quite compromised and ill that can still, for a, for a finite period of time, right, still uphold a really high level of whatever yeah. might be performance academically, athletically, professionally. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I will always, re I will remember a anorexic marathon runner I worked with like ages ago. And I mean, I just couldn't believe how she was even doing what she was doing mm -hmm. of how little she was eating. And I, and she had no bone stress injuries. She was getting her period. I was like, what, what is sure. happening? And it's like, this is not, I just kept telling her, I'm like, I know you don't believe me. This is not going to continue. Sure. You're a ticking time bomb. Like yep. something will come as Rebecca says, like the bill collector will come or whatever, you know? So, yes. uh, yeah. it's, yeah, but it's it's making assumptions based on body size. That's another, I think, really big yes. one. And it's it's really easy to do that because it's kind of been hammered into us. Oh, if you're anorexic, you're skinny. But it's like, sure. no, that's actually not the case. Absolutely. The, the, the other one I, I just wanted to, to mention, because I think it's really important, is that I think mm. oftentimes, and rightly so, there are certain eating disorders that get more airtime, for lack of a better word, like yeah. of, of being present and like the uh, restrictive, anorexic, malnourished, low, low weight individuals. Yep. Yes, they're, they're present and there's some serious health risks, but I do think proportionately prevalence rate binge eating is the highest prevalence rate of all eating disorders. And I, and I think sometimes in the athletic population, it can sometimes get, um, be, be missed or dismissed or not given the same attention screening, um, by sport, mental health, di dietary pro providers that, that they, needs to. So I just wanted to like yeah. bring that in. Cause I think sometimes, um, it can get bo boxed out, un unfortunately, which can feel really dismissive unintentionally, like for individuals struggling with, um, binge eating or, or ARFID or others, uh, too, yeah. that, are, that are not your maybe yeah. more stereotypical presentation or, yeah. or like something like orthorexia, which, or like even just normalized disordered eating, which mm -hmm. again, is just so part of her <laughs> societal yeah. makeup at this point that you don't even think much of it if someone's like on some extreme diet cutting all the things and whatever so it's it's very hard to uh, for some people to kind of tease out what's mm -hmm. disordered and what isn't because it's just so prevalent and common so um yeah. yeah that's that's uh yeah thank you for for pointing that out um we don't need to go more into, I mean, there's just, so, you would need like 10 episodes on eating disorder. So, <laughs> uh, I might have to pick your brain another day about oh, that yeah. and I'll let you go. But is there anything else that you want to add to this discussion that we haven't touched on that you think is really important in the context of what we've already discussed? No, I think, I think you did a great job. And and again, for sick of time, I think of, of course we scratched yeah. surface, but, and, and, and talked about some really important things. I, I think just, uh, one thing I'll add that maybe we didn't talk about, but that I know you have in your past um, past episodes is just the the utter need to have um, kind of a multidisciplinary team um, too. Like I think I think that might seem obvious, but I think for for those listening that that are athletes or parents or providers, I, I just think that's like so needed and constantly to evaluate. Like, do are the right people on board that need to be on board? Um, who's not at the table? <laughs> like like figuratively. Mm -hmm literally, but like that, that ought to, and needs to, to provide adequate support because it does take a village, you know, um, it's, it's very time and resource, um, consuming to, to address some of the things that we address. And it's a slow, sometimes painful process, but change is absolutely possible. And healing is absolutely, um, possible with, with the right, you know, support in place. Um, cause, cause I think some of this, um, it's not due to a lack of trying. It's not due to lack of competence or ability for individuals to make changes. But man, this this illness can be so insidious and stubborn and steadfast. And because of that, yeah. I do think it warrants 
the appropriate monitoring, support, feedback, and provi and, and providers kind of place. So that, that'd be the only other thing I think just to constantly evaluate and to kind of like um, think about in, in terms of adequacy of support. And sometimes you got to get kind of creative with, with that, just given resources. But I think that's absolutely. Sort of like piece. Yeah, I mean, I wish access were a little better mm -hmm. for uh, eating disorder treatments for other, you know, mental health disorders and all that. I mean, it's hard. It's definitely hard for some people. But um, but yeah, having a team is definitely super important. I know for many of my athletes, I'm in touch with their therapist, or I'm encouraging that they get a therapist. As you know, I've sent people to you guys. Mm -hmm. I'm like, you need to, you need to see somebody. I'm not sure. going to be enough. <laughs> Um, so just knowing your limitations as a provider and, and really uh, relying on others in different specialty areas to kind of help help out. But awesome. Right. Well, thank you so much, Riley. Where can everyone find you online if they want to learn more about you, reach out, work with you? Yeah. Yeah. So you can visit our website. Um, it's www.mindbodyendurance.com. So three words. Um, so we're there. We're on um, Instagram under that same handle as well. Um, there's a contact us form. Um, we have, uh, stellar, um, sports psychology providers and sport dietitians that are far more knowledgeable, wise and experienced than I am. So I, I learn from them on the daily. So I'm really fortunate to work with such a passionate group of individuals and our, from a licensing standpoint, I think, um, for our mental health providers, I think we're in 40, 45 or 46 out of the 50 States. We can provide care via telehealth and, and our dietitians kind of have a, a wide range, two of States that they can provide care. So awesome. Do you guys just do telehealth or do you ever see people in person? Um, I have an office here in, in St. Louis. Oh, so I, yeah, oh, nice. physical okay. office. So um, have, have that space. And I think most of our other providers are, are via telehealth, but I'm, we're, we, we have a yeah. physical location here and in, in got Louis. it. I wasn't sure when I was looking at your website, but yes. that's, that's always good to know. Yes. Awesome. Well, thanks so much, Riley. I really appreciate your, you sharing your expertise with us today and, we covered a lot of ground as promised. Yes, we did. Thank, <laughs> thanks so much for your efforts and all, all that you do, Claire. Appreciate yeah. uh, the opportunity here. Yeah, thanks. Okay. So that's our show for today. I hope you all enjoyed that one. And if you did, please make sure you hit follow or subscribe wherever you listen. And of course, if you have a minute, I would be so grateful if you could also rate and review my show wherever it is that you listen. If you're able to support the show financially, I do have a Patreon page. I'd love to see you over there in my community because Patreon members get some really great perks, including merchandise, huge discounts on my digital resources, and so much more. And by the way, speaking of digital resources, I have like, I think at least five or six free digital resources that you can find on my website. So if you want, uh, for instance, some race day fueling plan templates or you know, guidance on what to eat before exercise and all kinds of other goodies, uh, you can head on to my website and grab those for free. And of course, I also have low cost um, ones as well for purchase. They're like, you know, five to seven dollars. All right. Thank you so much for your support. And please feel free to email me, Claire at E for Endurance, with any feedback, questions or topic requests. All right. See you all next time.